I am incredibly gratified to see so many of you who have come out, and in the other room I say hello to you, but uh, to have come out to hear this presentation on the African origins of humankind. And this has been not only a scientific journey for me, but also very much a personal journey. My initial research in Africa began in 1970, a long time ago, 43 years ago, and I have continued to return to Africa to look for answers to a question which every one of us in this room has asked ourselves, where did we come from? And I have dedicated my work predominantly to searching for, discovering, and interpreting the fossil record, the fossil discoveries for our origins, and have tried to contribute as best I can to answering that question from the view of a scientist. And I was launched as a young boy, around 13 years old, in this quest for human ancestor fossils by reading a book entitled Man's Place in Nature. And as an undergraduate, this book was published back in the 1800s by Thomas Henry Huxley. And as an undergraduate, as an anthropology major, the first book we used was a book by a German anthropologist who made the statement that humans are super organic, that we are beyond the natural world, that we are above the organic world because we are the pinnacle of creation, whether it's creation by a creator or a creation, in my case, through natural selection, and that because we have become such advanced cultural beings, cultural creatures, we depend on culture for our survival, we had moved out of the classic biological world of evolution by means of natural selection. And I recall arguing with my very first professor that this could not be true. And it has been a theme in my life one of my motivating factors for doing what I do is not just to find a fossil, not to find something that we sometimes refer to as missing links, but to find fossilized links like Lucy and the many other fossils I have found that remind us of our link to the natural world. And it has always appeared to me even as a teenager, that if we do not embrace the knowledge that we are part and continue to be part of the natural world, we will continue to make mistakes that will irreparably and negatively impact on the very natural world that created us. And it seems to me that if we as scientists can document and understand through scientific methodology and inquiry that we are part of the natural world and the natural world, at least on this planet, at least during our lifetime, our career on this planet, beginning say six or seven million years ago, nature has been the guiding hand. And if we know who our creator is, in this case nature, and all of us who think about a creator want to be respectful to that creator, it seems to me that it is very important that we as supposedly wise people, homo sapiens, pay much closer attention to the existing natural world and treat her much more gently than we have in the past. Because we as all life on this planet are dependent on the natural world for survival. So that has been very much my motivating
and I would suppose philosophical perspective on why I think it is so important to document our origins. But naturally, I'm also interested and have always been interested in trying to understand the shape of the human family tree, where the fossils reside on that tree, what the factors were that crafted us as Homo sapiens. And I've chosen the title Africa and the Origins of Humankind because the birth of paleoanthropology, the study of human origins, is traced back to Europe with the very first discovery of a Neanderthal in 1856 when scientists first caught a glimpse that there may have been more ancestral, we use the word primitive, stages or species than exist for humans today. And this led to discoveries of uh, Cro-Magnon in France uh, and so on. And what it led to in the late, early 1900s and through much of the 20th century was the development of a very Eurocentric view of human evolution. That Europe was in some way the finishing school for humanity. That this is where we really became human. And this led to a aversion to looking in Africa. Yet today, barely 150 years, 200 years later, there is decidedly a very different view. And that view is that all of the major milestones, all of the major features we consider as making us human, language, big brains, walking upright, making tools, having bodies of modern proportions, and evolving into our species, Homo sapiens, are all documented first in Africa. So this has been a very major revolution in thinking. Even when I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, our textbooks talked about how Neanderthals evolved into sapiens. And I'm sure you've all seen reconstructions of these Neanderthals. And Europeans, actually the French, of course, reacted very negatively to this because they certainly didn't want to be um, evolved from some strange looking beast like a Neanderthal. I mean, after all, he was a German. They didn't want to, they didn't want to accept that idea that they had come from Germans. So Neanderthal, so Cro-Magnon was found in France and this was a very respectable ancestor, right? He was French. He was uh, older than um, Neanderthal, they thought. And then of course the English who to a very large extent think that they are the pinnacle of evolution. They didn't have a fossil, so they invented one called Piltdown Man, which was a hoax. And three scientists were knighted over this fake skull. So it shows you there is a very nationalistic sort of leaning to this field. And all this time resting on undiscovered, unexplored, unappreciated slopes in Africa or hillsides in the Great Rift Valley were fossils that would tell us a very different story. So this is the story that I'm going to talk to you about today, about the discovery of Lucy. And maybe we can turn down these uh, lights here so you get a better view of the um, uh, illustrations. So we've looked at a, long enough at a map of Africa. And of course, the great organizer of the idea, the theory of evolution, was articulated by this gentleman, uh, Charles Darwin. And in 1859, he published a book that was to really revolutionize the understanding of the natural world. 
this is a pretty big thing. It was, and we, I'm, I don't know how you say this in Italian, but this was a, a paradigm shift. And a paradigm shift means a complete, total shift in ideas that eliminate all of the previous ideas with an entirely new perspective. And we use that word, at least in America, improperly all the time. That it is, it is, this is a major innovation. And it was made fascinating by a man who left England once, a man who did not really want to publish this because he lived in a world that was very religious. And in his Origin of Species, if you want to learn what he has to say about human evolution, you have to go to the very last page of the book. And all he says in a classic English understatement is light will be thrown on the origin of man in his history. He didn't say very much. There's no use of the word evolution in there. There is no uh, um, use of the word prehistory. It's a very modest and disarming statement. Darwin knew in his mind that all life evolved and that human life would be no different. But he was married to a very religious woman and he loved his wife, Emma, and he didn't want her upset and have to live with her his whole life. So he wrote this in his original Origin of Species, but it was enough to make everybody in England unhappy, or at least those who thought, well, it's all right if the cockroach or the rat evolves, but certainly not man. And the book that I read uh, by Thomas Henry Huxley, Evidence as to Man's Place in Nature, published in 1863, just four years after Darwin, was a collection of essays that he had given to the average person, popularizing and spreading the word of Darwin's revolution. And in that book, he essentially looked at skulls and skeletons and noted the great similarities in the bow plan of particularly orangutans, chimps, gorillas, and humans. And one of the core ideas in Darwin is the idea of a common ancestor, an ancestor that gave rise to descendants. And in this case, they suggested, Huxley just suggested, that there was a common ancestor to particularly the chimpanzee and modern humans. Now, this was an inference that they made based on the strength of the theory and on the strength of the anatomy so that there were no fossils, right? It's a rather intimidating thing to have pointing at me. Um, so there were no fossils discovered in Africa. Uh, very few people had been to Africa, and no one knew very much about chimpanzees. And as you see in this, uh, and I don't want to read the text, but clearly Huxley makes it very clear that we were shared an ancestor with the African apes. And we now know from extensive field work, naturalistic field work, as you know, initiated by Jane Goodall, but many other teams now studying these apes in the wild, that there are, it's not just the anatomy that is similar between us and chimpanzees, the same number of teeth, uh, same sorts of muscles, same arrangement of, of much of the skeleton, except chimps walk on four legs and we walk on two legs. But they are, have been documented as using rudimentary tools. They certainly, you don't see them holding iPhones in this picture, but you do see them using a twig or a blade of grass to go termite fishing. You see them using stones not a carefully fashioned tool, but a stone and an anvil to break open nuts. And here, this little chimp over here is eating one of those. 
And look how intently he's watching how this is happening. You know, you, we can argue whether it's imitation or learning or what. But if a chimp does not see this behavior as a infant, it doesn't do it. And it's only in certain groups of chimpanzees. In some groups, they use this sort of method for breaking open hard nuts. In others, they use this. And there are many behavioral activities that are distinct between populations in Africa. I wouldn't necessarily call them cultural traditions, but they are behavioral traditions that are learned and passed on from generation to generation. And we know that emotionally, they're very similar to us. They experience excitement and joy. They experience sadness. They experience fear. This chimpanzee, young chimpanzee here, these are termites flying. And he's not trying to catch them. He's just in awe of what is happening. This is a, a very familiar human feature. And of course, most recently, as they say, the truth is in the genes. We have done a genome sequence for chimpanzees. And as you know, we've completed the human genome. And uh, there have been laboratories that have sequenced the genome of chimpanzees. And we are about 98% identical. 2% makes enormous difference. But you don't have that degree of identity unless you have a common ancestor. So that there's no longer, I think, any question that these two creatures shared a common ancestor. <laughs> you probably recognize somebody there. Now, if a theory, in the true sense of a theory, is to be robust or strong, it should not only explain the natural phenomena which it deals with, but it should make predictions. It should be a theory that can be tested. We have a, a, a theory that you all know called gravity. And some people say, oh, it's just a theory. But how many times do we have to do this to convince us with that experiment that gravity is a fact. It will always fall to the floor. Theoretically, of course, all the molecules and atoms could be lined up where there was no gravity for one split second. But none of us have experienced that. So that's as good a proof for a theory as you can get. And that was an experiment I just did. It could have flown to the ceiling, which would have been quite remarkable. We would have all been in the newspaper tomorrow. And what Darwin and Huxley suggested was that in spite of the Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons found in Europe, Africa would prove to be the crucible, the homeland for humanity. And that was tested in 1924 when this cheerful looking guy, uh, Raymond Dart, was given this child's skull and partial endocast of the brain. And he recognized from the placement of certain crenulations or sulci on the brain, particularly the lunate back here, that there was much more occipital region than there was in chimps. He recognized that even though it was a child, probably died around age three, that the teeth, particularly the canine, was quite reduced. And he suggested and gave it this tongue twister name, Australopithecus africanus, which really means it's, a, it's a, the wrong name because it really means the southern ape of Africa, which it is not. I wish he had chosen a better name, but there are reasons why we cannot change that. And he published this in the journal Nature as an example of a link between apes and humans. And he also noticed that at the base of the skull, under there, there is the foramen, foramen magnum, the big hole, where the spinal cord comes out straight down. And that would only happen on a body that is upright. 
You can imagine if it happened uh, to your dog, the dog would be running around looking at the ground all the time. Never know where it was going. So this is an anatomical positioning of the spinal cord that is in agreement with upright walking. And of course, all of his professors in England, where he had studied, thought he was crazy. And they were also extremely jealous. And because they were English and because they were his professors, they were offended that Dart would go and discover this, write it up, and publish it without consulting them. So they tried to convince the world that it was an ape, which of course it wasn't. One of the things that we are interested in is trying to find the timing of when the common ancestor, an ape-like creature that lived in the Miocene, gave rise to two different evolutionary trajectories. One that led to the African apes, and there were many apes. Today we only have really three apes in Africa, the bonobo, the chimpanzee, and the gorilla. But in the late Miocene, middle Miocene, there were many, many different kinds of apes. Tens, maybe even hundreds of species, but certainly tens of species. And apes have been in decline ever since the Miocene. Uh, the closest guess, based on similarities in genetics and so on, suggests that that common ancestor gave rise to these two evolutionary these two evolutionary trajectories somewhere between five and eight million years ago, and I suspect closer to eight million years. So what came before Australopithecus? Uh, certainly a very ape-like looking creature like this. This is a hypothetical reconstruction based on nothing but an artist's rendering, really. But we know that the apes have changed less since that separation than we have. We have changed considerably since that eight million year divergence. Whereas the African apes who have continued to live in the kind of environments in which that common ancestor lived, more forested environments, have changed less because the pressures of natural selection were very different among apes and humans because we began to do other things such as stand up and to explore other parts of the environment. I've called this uh, pre-Australopithecus, and there are a number of names. I don't want to burden those of you who are not really uh, specialists in this, but there are a number of different genera and species, such as Auroran, Ardipithecus, Sahelanthropus from Chad. Uh, this is a, a, a real bone of contention. Uh, many people think it was probably an ancestor to the present-day apes and not to us, but this is being considered now. And Auroran, these two clearly show signs of upright walking. And that date is six million years. So it appears that our peculiar mode of locomotion in, in mammals, among mammals, no other mammals walk on two legs like we do, and our ancestors, may go back to as much as six million years. There, are a, there is a small collection of things from Ethiopia, Ardipithecus cadaba, which um, also we have no really good uh, leg bones or bones from the pelvis, but uh, there is one little toe bone here that suggests that it may have come from a bipedal foot, an upright walking foot. The best evidence for pre-Australopithecus comes from Ardipithecus. Ardipithecus uh, ramidus was initially discovered in Ethiopia in 1992 by a team under the direction of Tim White at the University of California at Berkeley. This is the Awash River, which runs through Ethiopia from the highlands down through the lowlands. Uh, here you see a map of, uh, of Ethiopia. The East, the East African Rift comes up here, just outside of Addis Ababa. The rift 
spreads into a very large area known after the local people, the Afar people, as the Afar Rift or the Afar Triangle because it's uh, triangular shaped. This is where uh, Lucy was found, just up here, and about 60, 80 kilometers to the south is where, at the site of Aramis, is where this collection of bones were found in 1992. They were ultimately published about three years ago. Uh, they date, as you can see, to 4.4 million years, one, over 1.2 million years older than Lucy, who was 3.2 million years. And one of the difficulties with the specimen, and it is, it is in some ways, in the hands and feet, more complete than Lucy, and in the skull, uh, which we'll address shortly, but it was, they, th they claim, a female. I think it, 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 this is a very large female at 50 kilos. Lucy only weighed about 30 kilos. And they uh, have suggested that this is a creature that was an ancestor to Lucy's species, Australopithecus afarensis, and a, um, a, a predecessor at 4.4 million. But there are some very peculiar things about the species. Extraordinarily large hands for grasping powerful hands. And as you all have noticed, I'm sure, a large divergent great toe. And here you see it draped over this branch. And if you look at yourself in the shower in the morning, if you have a foot like that, you have to call me. <laughs> because you are a throwback. But our big toe is much shorter and is in fully in line with the rest of the foot because we have adapted to upright walking. And there are a number of us, including myself, who, and you see how incredibly long the upper limb is, comes down below the knee. You don't see anybody walking around campus like that, right? With arms that long. So this is somewhat of a dilemma. There are some features in the pelvis which suggest uprightness. There are features in the base of the skull. I've seen the specimen. And the base of the skull suggests that it was much more upright than an ape. But does upright, being upright, mean that it was bipedal on the ground? I don't think so. I think that the anatomical adaptations, particularly in this organ, the foot, are classic for climbing in trees. And it is very possible, I think, that, and here is the reconstruction we always see of Artipithecus. If you always reconstruct it and always publish it on the ground like this, everyone gets the impression that it was living on the ground, walking upright. But this would have been the source of significant difficulty for weight-bearing and locomotion in a terrestrial habitat. Uh, I think it's more likely that this was a more arboreal creature, that it spent really the predominance of its time in the trees, and would have had a combination of this quadrupedal walk in trees. And we see today that African chimps are facultatively upright in the trees, meaning from time to time. And there is a t trend among the apes for uprightness. And it is very possible that this was a creature not unlike what we see in some of these pictures that was experimenting uh, with upright walking in arboreal habitats that I think ultimately led to a side branch. You know, we always see, and you saw this in the earlier pictures when we were getting ready, this classic idea of walking and getting more and more upright. You start as a four-legged animal, and at the end of every one of those drawings is a white European male as the pinnacle of evolution. My students say, why is it always a white European male? I said, because white European males draw these. <laughs> Homo egocentricus. And... Um, I think that it, there is a possibility that the acquisition of upright walking, which ultimately became bipedalism as we use it, 
may have had more than one development. And most recently, a foot has been found by an Ethiopian colleague of mine that is only 3.4 million years old. And that's an important date because Lucy's species, Afarensis, goes back to at least 3.7, 3.8 million years as a full biped. And I'll show you one of those feet shortly. Yet this has a divergent toe. It, that suggests that this was a parallel line. There's only one illustration in Darwin's origin of species, of a branching tree. It's not a straight line. And I think that's what we're seeing in this diversity in early humans. So that if you leave an imprint as a quadruped like this, you would have a largely divergent big toe. The hallux would be divergent. This is a fossil footprint, which I will show you a little more detail of, but that's what your footprint looks like. It not only has a very strong impression of the great toe, but it is characterized by having an arch to the foot, which is like a, a shock absorber that you have in your car, for example. And here is a footprint made in a volcanic ash, which was discovered under the direction of the late Mary Leakey at a site known as Lytoli. And there was a volcanic eruption, much like we have here in the Mediterranean area, and Volcanic ash comes out, and it fell like, a, like snow, and it was a light rain. We can tell that because those are raindrop impressions in here. And it became very muddy, and at least two creatures walked across there, and because this is long before people were wearing shoes, you see the great toe, strongly impressed, these are the lateral toes. You see a very strong strike of the heel, which is what we do when we walk. And then we roll off onto the outside of the foot. And there is the arch from front to back and from side to side. That's a very human-like footprint, but it's 3.7 million years old during the time of Lucy's species, Afarensis, and during the time of that foot I just showed you with the divergent toe. So the fossils, the fossil bones, particularly the teeth and jaws that were found at Lytoli, are identical to the ones I find in Ethiopia that belong to Lucy's species, Afarensis, named after the Afar people in the Afar region. And here you see the volcano 3.7 million years ago. And astonishingly for us, there was the eruption, the little rain, people walked across there, then there was another eruption, and it sealed it until erosion 3.7 million years ago, later, in a rainstorm, washed the cover away and exposed this footprint trail. One of the great wonders of the ancient world. Turning to the site where I work in Ethiopia, uh, I was just there and, and actually took this photograph in November, but it's very close to the first place I stood in 1972 when I went there with a French geologist and peered out into this landscape. And this was a, a dream come true for me because you see the horizontal sediments. You see light sediments here. These are volcanic ashes that we can use for geological dating. And they seem to go on and on and on. And the next morning when we traveled down into these deposits at the site of Hadar, Ethiopia, we saw that the ground was littered, that there were, it was a very fossil rich area. And a little closer map, here you see the Great Rift Valley coming into Ethiopia. This is present-day Ethiopia here, Eritrea up in the north. And the Great Rift Valley just here. And this is the site of Hadar again, which is just west of Djibouti uh, and the Gulf of Aden. And here is the Red Sea. 
just to give you a little reference. And we undertook extensive geological work to map all of these deposits. And it's very important to know the stratigraphy and to build a framework in which to place our discoveries. And there are layers of volcanic ash, one here. This is a basalt or a lava. Here's a volcanic ash, volcanic ash, volcanic ash that go back to about 3.4 million years and get younger as you get towards the top, which they should. Obviously, these are the older, these are the younger layers. And once we began to discover fossils, and we gave them these field numbers, off our locality, 137, 128, 333, and Lucy, which is 288. And it is immediately above a volcanic ash dated at 3.2 million years. So her age is roughly 3.2 million years. And the precision, to use a scientific word, of the age of 3,240,000 years means that a volcano erupted in that region 3,240,000 years ago, plus or minus 10,000 years. So that's a very precise date. Argon dating has gotten very precise in determining the ages. Well, here you see a, a much more tanned and a much thinner and a much younger Don Johansson at the very spot where I made the discovery on the 24th of November. I was with a graduate student. Of course, he's doing all the work, you can see. One of the great advantages of being a professor. And uh, yes, we're using toilet paper to wrap these up. It's one of the things that protects the fossils, best of anything, it turns out. And what happened was I was out on a survey. It's the only way you can find these is to look for them when they, and hope to get them after they've just eroded out of these geological layers. And I spied this bone. I saw over my right shoulder a little bone like this, which is the elbow. And this little bump here is what we really think of as our elbow. And it is the bone from the forearm that allows us to flex and extend. It's called the ulna. And I knew from my studies of comparative anatomy that this was not a monkey, that this was not an antelope, that it w had to belong to a human ancestor, although it was very, very small. And as we looked up this slope, there are markers being put in we found fragments of a skull, fragments of a jaw, fragments, unbelievably, of a pelvis. And after just really two weeks of excavation uh, at this locality, we were able to reassemble a very familiar, really iconic picture to all of us, which appears in textbooks all over the world, and has become sort of the reference point for many people, both scientists and non-scientists alike, for understanding human origins. And when we were celebrating her discovery, we were playing a, a Beatles tape. And my girlfriend was with me, and she said, well, if you think it's a female, you should call her Lucy after Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And that's how she got her name. I gave her her real name, her scientific name in 1978, four years later, when I was able to convincingly compare her with all of the other species of Australopithecus and to distinguish her from all other species. Now, the length of the thigh bone, the femur here, that from there to there is only 12 inches. So that's 280 millimeters, 28 centimeters roughly. So that's short. Think of the length of your thigh bone, okay? She is not a child because the mandible, the third molar, which uh, I don't know what you call it in Italian, we call it the wisdom tooth, is the sign that biological growth is more or less stopped. 
so that this is considered to be an adult. And uh, yet her stature was only a little over a meter when you reconstruct it on the base of her, basis of her, the length of her femur. But what is most astonishing is that we had the innominate and the sacrum of the pelvis preserved, which meant we could mirror image this and make a whole pelvis. And the pelvis is the crucial anatomical region for upright walking. And we had only had one of these before from South Africa. Uh, and this one turned out to be very unique and important indeed for understanding upright walking. Uh, we have parts of the spinal cord and the rib cage. Unfortunately, most of her skull, I think her skull rolled out and was broken up and scattered very early in the erosion. But we now have complete skulls of males and females, which I will show you shortly. And on the basis of this skeleton and many other discoveries, I named in 1978 a new species, Australopithecus afarensis. The Lucy specimen is 3.2 million years in age. The other thing that is interesting about her skeleton, and here you have the femur, thigh bone, and here you have the humerus, or the upper arm bone, and when we make comparisons with a human condition, you can do this yourself. You can see how short, relatively, your upper arm is, but really how long your thigh bone is. This lower limb is an important lever in locomotion. And obviously, as we know from basic physics, the longer the lever arm, the more powerful and efficient is that limb. But when you look at a chimp, both the femur and the upper arm bone are equal. It's 100% of the length of the femur. And ours is only 70%. That's quite short compared to that. These are from the same individual. And Lucy's is about 85%. So her lower limbs were relatively short compared to ours. They weren't like a chimp, but they were relatively short, and, or you could say that the arms were relatively long, which is probably an evolutionary leftover from these creatures that had lived most of their time in trees and used those arms for climbing. This is an early uh, reconstruction of Lucy's cranium based on not very many fragments. We had other specimens that we used also, but I'll show you what a complete one looks like now. And it had a very small brain, about 380 milliliters. Uh, relatively speaking, it had a large face. And we reconstructed her pelvis. And if you make comparisons with an ape, a chimpanzee, and a human, this is the pelvis. This is what you're all sitting on, except for those of you standing. And uh, if you are a quadruped, you have a very high, long, narrow hip. So that the acetabulum, or the hip socket, where the femur fits in, is very, very far from the, where, the, where the sacrum articulates. And that's why you see apes when they walk. They walk from side to side. Because the center of gravity in an ape is way up in its chest. A human here has shortened these, and there's very little distance between the acetabulum and the sacrum, and it has rotated the blades, the innominates, from facing forwards to developing into a basin. And that is what supports our viscera, but it also takes the gluteus muscles. Our most prominent muscle, of course, is the gluteus maximus. But it takes the gluteal muscles that were facing backwards and moves them to the side that attach from the top of the femur to the top of the iliac blade, which adds stability. And that's why we don't walk like that. And you can test this when you walk out of here tonight. You can grab your hip muscles, 
and you'll see that when you lift, say, your left foot, they all f are acting on the right to keep you from collapsing over to the left. So we could see all of these adaptations in Lucy's pelvis that functionally were related to a very similar mode of locomotion to us, bipedalism. And with these very long, gangly kind of arms, they may have had a slightly different gait. Uh, the placement of the position of the center of gravity, I don't know if it would have changed, but in a, in a modern human, it's right behind your pubis. So it's not up here in your chest, it's down within the pelvis. And uh, that lowers the center of gravity so that you, you're not top heavy and have difficulty walking. And certainly these long arms may have been used somewhat differently in walking, but all of the bones of the feet, and we have a virtually complete foot now, as well as those footprints, reflect upright, terrestrial, committed uh, bipedalism. They didn't do this from time to time. I think they did this consistently when they were on the ground. So we now have in Africa a common ancestor, which we haven't found yet, but it was much more ape-like, and we have the acquisition of upright walking, two features that uh, are unique. And as I said, our center of gravity is actually right, it's not, it's not, I'm sorry, it's not behind the pubis, it's right up here in front of the sacrum, right up in here. And uh, here is Lucy who would have been much shorter in stature. We have enough bones from male, much larger specimens that probably weighed up to 50 kilos. And their stature was probably a meter and a half or so. So there was a lot of difference in size between males and females, something we call sexual dimorphism. And as I often say, Lucy is not alone. Our expeditions have been remarkably successful. They are, we just had our most recent one last November. And we have over 400 specimens of afarensis. Not as complete as Lucy, of course, but uh, here she is. But we do have complete female skulls and complete male skulls for the very first time. We did not, we started working at this site in 1972, and it wasn't until 1992 that we found a complete skull of a male. So this was one of the important new additions. We have many jaws, both upper and lower, lots of teeth. We have probably the most complete collection for a fossil species of Australopithecus over 400,000 years of time from any site in Africa. So one of my goals was to make this an extensive collection that could be used in comparative studies, not of just creatures that lived at the same time, but was that we could look at over time. And uh, this is indeed what has happened. So one of the goals uh, is to try to put a phylogeny together, a tree of relationships. And um, again, there are lots of staggering names on here, but here is Afarensis, Lucy species, which undoubtedly came out of this species, Anamensis, from northern Kenya. We published uh, a couple of years ago a very, very extensive paper suggesting that there is a lineage here. This uh, Australopithecus gari uh, was something that died out. And we have postulated that Afarensis was an ancestor to the Homo group here, genus Homo. And we know with this solid line that it was an ancestor to these large-toothed megadont, later more derived Australopithecus. We have a lineage that goes from about 4.2 million right on up 
to about 1.5 million. And that's unique to have identified a lineage in a fossil record. That's rare, and particularly rare for human evolution. One can see that these creatures, they have crests on the top of their skulls for the insertion of big chewing muscles. They have extremely big jaws with massive teeth, and they were predominantly vegetarians. And this particular species, Atheopicus, has a very projecting face like Afarensis, but it has the crest and it has big molars. So we can say, we can say something for the very first time about the, what features changed over time and when that happened. That the big molars and the big jaws evolved first and then the faces reduced later. So these are details that we are now able to tease out of the fossils that tell us something about evolutionary change over time and why that evolutionary change happened because it was associated with a dietary shift. Uh, and we hope to do that for these lineages over here as well. So in terms of the human family tree, and here is Artipithecus, which I think is a separate lineage. There's great argument about this, and there will be great argument about it. But the important thing about Afarensis is, and it's so fortuitous, what a wonderful thing to have happened. It happens to sit chronologically and anatomically at a pivotal, crucial place on the tree. These fossils, like Aurorin and Sahelanthropus, we mentioned briefly, and Artipithecus, are all very ape-like. And somewhere around three million years ago, there was the next major diversification, or bifurcation, or trifurcation, of what in biology we call an adaptive radiation, meaning that once they became bipedal, they began to live different life ways in different places. This is very classic of mammal evolution. And she, her species, Afarensis, sits at that pivotal point where one, two, three, maybe four lineages came off. And that is really quite unique for human origins. And we will talk more briefly about these later homo individuals, but the real importance of Afarensis is that it's widespread. We know it from Chad, there's one mandible. We know it from Tanzania, we know it from Kenya, and mostly from Ethiopia. And we know it from geological time periods from about 3.8 million to about 3 million years, 800,000 years. That's four times as long as we have been around Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens has been around for about 200,000 years. Afarensis was around for 800,000 years. So we think our future is guaranteed. I'm sure Afarensis thought the same thing, but it disappeared. It had descendants, which ultimately, of course, evolved into these other lineages. So the Megadont group, as we see it here, uh, consists of a number of species from South Africa, A. robustus, uh, from Eastern Africa, A. boisei. This is the classic Old Divide Gorge discovery in 1959 by uh, Lewis and Mary Leakey. And you see how enormous these jaws are. They're very, very thick. That is at least three centimeters from side to side. And these molars are enormous and the incisors, the front teeth for slicing, are very, very crowded because the other teeth have expanded so much, there's very little room. So natural selection is selecting for a cuisinart, a creature that can do lots of crushing and grinding. And to, to move mechanically jaws that big, you need massive muscles. Two muscles, the masseter muscle that comes off the cheekbone or zygomatic, and the temporalis muscles that 
are so massive that an extra gorilla-like crest grows on the top of these skulls. So if you were a thoughtful and thinking, you weren't, a forensis, and somebody asked you the question that everybody asked me, where are we going as a species, anatomically, they would never have predicted this. So that's the other thing that is so interesting about evolution does not have a goal. It is not a teleological process that had a aim. It is susceptible to the changes, whether they are purposeful or not purposeful in the natural world. And creatures respond to those changes. And they may evolve in hitherto unthinkable directions. Another important lesson. At the moment, my research is focusing more on the origins of our own genus, Homo. And we know much more about Australopithecus. We have thousands of specimens of Australopithecus. We know more about its distribution in Africa, about its distribution over time, about its unique anatomical and behavioral adaptations, about uh, its life history. We know from studies of how teeth develop using scanning machines that the layers of enamel were laid down very quickly. So Lucy, with her third molar erupted, was not 18, like we are when we erupt our third molar. She was more like 10 or 12 years old when she died, had an ape-like pattern. So we know a great deal about Australopithecus and very little about our own genus, which is odd. And uh, our expedition has begun to search in younger deposits, younger layers at the top of that geological column and a number of years ago, our collectors found this jaw at 2.4 million. And it was associated with rudimentary, but clearly purposely made tools. Now you say, how does he know that that tool was purposely made? Well, for the archaeologists in the audience, you will notice that there's a little flat platform here. And that is where some hand held a rock and hit it with another purposely in a spot that moved that flake off of the core. And that's a purposely made tool. Any archaeologist who would look at it would say, that's the striking platform, and this is the, what we call the, the bulb of percussion, where the waves go through the rock, and that there's a rounded bulb or bulge. And these are associated. We don't know if this individual made that tool, but certainly was from that same, the same layer. And this is what a chimp upper jaw looks like. It's long from front to back. It's narrow from side to side. This is what your, and it's very shallow, very shallow. Yours is more rounded. And if you put the tongue in the roof of your mouth, it's very domed and deep. And it's very short from front to back and broad from side to side. And you can see how Australopithecus is very much like the ape. But this jaw is very much like Homo. And this is the only specimen that we have from this time period between two and three million years indicating the emergence of our own genus. Very soon thereafter, we saw, like with the Megadont Australopithecus, a diversification into something called Habilis, Ergaster, Rudolfensis, and then much later things like Heidelbergensis and Sapiens. But again, it reacted and responded in a classic adaptive radiation like Australopithecus, like mammals, if you remember. 65 million years ago, dinosaurs went extinct. They had ruled the planet for hundreds of millions of years. Mammals were around but there were very few of them, very few species. But as soon as the dinosaurs went extinct and there was an opportunity to occupy many of the environments that, ma that reptiles lived in, mammals underwent a diversification into all the different families of mammals we see on the planet today. So this is a very classic mode of evolutionary change. 
The major differences from when I was a student in 1970 and made my first trip to Africa was that in terms of fossil species, we had three, four, five, six, seven different species of humans. And uh, what is interesting to note is that some of the time there were three or four species living at the same time. But today, we have almost t over 20 species that are upright walking bipeds, probably. Uh, there's a question about some of these down here in the pre-Australopithecus region. But we have a much richer tree and a much richer storehouse of different species to try to put together as we did in that slide I showed you a little while ago. And we see that there was a common ancestor, obviously, somewhere down here, that one of the f major things that happened first was reduction of the canines. If you look in the mouth of a chimp or a gorilla, they have huge canines. If you look in your neighbor's mouth, you have very small canines. Canine reduction is probably goes back to over five million years ago. Very soon thereafter, or maybe coincident, we don't know, was the acquisition of bipedalism. Why did we, the, the, the incorrect, one of the things you learn in science is that if you can't find an answer to a question, sometimes you're asking the wrong question. It sounds strange, but anthropologists have for decades said, why did we stand up? Well, the reason we have never been able to answer that question is because we, that's the wrong question. The question should be, what are the advantages of standing up? Because evolution is a reproductive game. If those individuals with the new innovation have an innovation that is better than the other members of the species, they will leave more offspring in the next generation. And that new adaptation will flourish. Upright walking probably is very complex and has a great deal of advantages. We used to think it was for looking over tall grass. You may remember with the savanna hypothesis, when we left the forest, there was this tall grass, so stand up and look over the tall grass. Well, this would be great, because you're a biped. You can't run very fast. There are lions and leopards and saber-toothed cats who now know you're on the menu. And you're out of the gene pool. And we wouldn't be here today. So bipedalism must have had a complex series of advantages, I think largely freeing the forelimbs, which become upper limbs, for carrying things. And it's a, it's a very complex argument, but whenever you look at apes in the wild, I occasionally go to Tanzania to Jane Goodall's site, and when you see the apes walking upright, they're usually carrying food, bananas or fruits or whatever. They don't have, you know, baskets and carts and things like that. So they carry that. And maybe they're able to carry enough of that food back to their offspring. A male chimp doesn't know who his offspring is, of course, because multiple males have intercourse with a female. But they may bring this food back to a place that they call a home base and they do have a home base, and this food is shared with other individuals, begged for or freely given or whatever, and it allows those offspring to get through more years to become adults and to pass on their genes. And the ones that don't get the food, that don't have others bringing it to them in a bipedal fashion, may not reproduce. So it's a very complex but very interesting uh, adaptation and uh, with certainly incredible benefits because if we are the only species to walk upright on the planet, it's pretty damn successful. There are seven billion of us on the planet. So there was certainly, it isn't why we became upright or why did we become upright. Natural selection doesn't have something in mind. But when a new innovation comes along, that allows it to leave more genes in the next generation. 
then that adaptation has the advantage. Okay. Um, then we went through a period of enlarging the teeth, which I think is a dietary reaction, even in early afarensis, because they were eating tough seeds and nuts, probably bird's eggs, crocodile eggs, turtle eggs, anything they could eat. And there were some, the megadont, Australopithecus, uh, which underwent a very dramatic dietary specialization. And then we saw about two million years ago or so, you notice I've not put any dates on this, this is what we call a cladogram, just to show these relationships outside of a time framework. Reduction in tooth size in general, which meant that they were probably, there was a significant change in diet. And what do we see at two million years? We see that the stone tools are now being used on bones so that meat, a very high source of energy, very high source of protein, very high source of amino acids that feeds the hungriest organ in your body, which is your brain, which is one of our hallmarks. And very soon thereafter, we see the first examples of encephalization, a spurt in brain size. And then much later, beginning maybe 300,000 years ago, we see an interesting emergence of Neanderthals in Europe and in Asia and in the Middle East. But we see no Neanderthals in Africa, and this is not a, a discussion of Neanderthals. Uh, but they have their own craniofacial specializations. Again, why do Neanderthals look the way Neanderthals look? To a large extent, because they were living in a periglacial environment in Europe. And many of those adaptations are adaptations to the cold. So just very broadly, I've divided these into the pre-homo and into the homo group. This is just a way to try, try to help you remember uh, these particular uh, individuals. Now, of course, in America, we don't study Latin, but you do, so you all know what this means. I have to translate it for my American audiences. It was written by Pliny the Elder, and it is certainly true. And what we are uncovering is extensive evidence that reaches back to 2.6 million years of the association of very elementary stone tools in association with bones that show cut marks and show in intense purposeful smashing of the bones. Even hyenas cannot break through these very thick bones of things like antelopes or hippos or rhinos or giraffes. They're just, the cortical bone is so thick. The only way you can do it is by smashing it with a large hammer stone like this to get a very nutritious dinner, bone marrow, which is uh, probably a, a wonderful source of energy. So there is this association between butchered bones and tools that reaches back as much as 2.6 million. As I said, we see the first major examples of brain expansion at about 2 million. This is a skull that's about 1.82 million years ago from Lake Turkana, known as 1470, that is close to 800 cubic centimeters. Lucy's was 380, sort of the average of modern chimps. And this does not happen until you have tools and evidence of meat in the diet. And then about 1.8 million years ago in a species Homo ergaster, the work, working man, you see that the lower limb, particularly the thigh bone, is greatly expanded. And that relatively speaking, this has a very long lower limb. It adds to the efficiency of bipedalism, but also this tall, linear body is like one sees in people who live near the equator, particularly nilotic people 
like uh, the Dinka, Nuer, Shaluk, these very tall um, Africans who live along these, in these very hot areas because they have a very high surface area to body mass ratio. And this is for, obviously, heat radiation to cool the body down. And the ratios of lower limbs and upper limbs in this 2 million year old specimen, 1.8 million year old specimen, is very much like you see in modern day uh, Dinka or, or uh, uh, Nuer people from southern Sudan. So this was an adaptation to, it was a thermal regulation. You look at Eskimos today, they're, they're very short and broad. Why? Because they live in cold climates. They want to be heat conservers, not radiators. The first out of Africa, leaving the homeland, uh, occurred around 1.8 million years and has been picked up unbelievably and unpredictably between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea in Georgia at a place called Dimanisi, not far from Tbilisi. And the skulls that are being found there are very similar to skulls just here on the eastern side of Lake Turkana. So there have been several out of Africa's for sure. I think that one of the features of humans is our curiosity and our ability and desire to explore. And I think that was true as long ago as 1.8 million years ago. There are fairly complete specimens now from southern Ethiopia that go back to as much as 200,000 years. Remember, people didn't get into Europe till we didn't get into Europe till about 40,000 years ago. And for 160,000 years of our existence, Africa was shaping our anatomy. So most of us in this room have a much more African body build than you really think. And sapiens, this is someone who you would be comfortable having a panino with, okay? He might have or she might have slightly more developed brow ridges and so on. Uh, but they would be able if, to sit down and probably understand quite a bit of what you were doing, whether they could actually run a Macintosh, I don't know. But certainly anatomically, if you saw them walking in Pavia, you would see them as homo sapiens. If you saw a Neanderthal, and I think most of the Neanderthals in this country are in the government, <laughs> as in our country. <laughs> but if you saw a Neanderthal, you would certainly see the difference. One of the great innovations in the development of tools was the switch from just bone tools, I mean uh, stone tools, to making tools of bone, antler, and ivory, which in Europe is classically associated with Cro-Magnon or the Upper Paleolithic, the finishing school. These are 70,000-year-old tools from South Africa that are twice as old as they are in Europe, suggesting that this was an innovation that we brought with us from Africa. And the Institute has, as another major, the Institute of Human Origins, where I work uh, at Arizona State University uh, in the United States, the other area that is interesting is the emergence of us the emergence of, of, of anatomically and behaviorally modern humans. I, I can't go into the details. This obviously has something to do very largely with what's going on inside this brain case of ours. It's like the hardware has been there, right, for a long time. But something, some emergent phenomenon clicked in probably around 150,000 years ago. And we now live in a very symbolic world. We use a symbolic language. Uh, we live in a symbolic world as opposed to a, a situational world where the only things we really communicate are what's happening now. We can talk about the future and the past and so on and so forth. And this is under the direction of Curtis Marion, one of our scientists at uh, uh, the Institute of Human Origins. He's excavating in these caves in southern Africa that go back to 150,000 years that overlook the Indian Ocean. The oceans have never cleaned them out, so he has continuous deposition to study. And he's catching glimpses of modern human behavior. 
And the most interesting thing about it is, here he is way down in southern Africa, and the sequences in the caves uh, are predominantly between uh, 200,000 and about 75,000 years ago. There was a very prolonged period in here, particularly from uh, about 190,000 years to about 120,000 years, which is determined on these sea cores. It's called marine isotope stage six, when it was very cold. Europe was just completely locked up in glaciers. And those glaciers brought about a cooling and drying of the rest of the world. And it was during this time of extreme stress when we see our first Homo sapiens. And this project is suggesting that there were progenitor populations in Africa in that marine isotope stage six that were the founder or progenitor populations of modern humans today. And one of the places where that was possible was in South Africa. Because in the excavations, he found massive accumulations of shells, a very important source, obviously, of uh, protein. And he's found uh, a, so you need proteins and you need carbohydrates. And if you go to South Africa and you're in Cape Town and you look at this Table Mountain, the variation in vegetation there is greater than in all of the British Isles. And the kinds of vegetation there, which are special to South Africa and only South Africa, have innumerable plants that store carbohydrates in big bulbs underground. And he has documented at 150,000 years the extensive use of ochre for body decoration. You can see ochre pencils. You can see the wear facets on them that suggest that they were being used for body decoration. And most recently, he's published in the journal Science this incredible breakthrough. They made stone tools, predominantly. And when you make stone tools, you want a rock like Silex or chert or flint that is very homogeneous so you can really make precise tools. And they were using a kind of tool that was made out of a, a, a terrible rock that if you hit just shatters into pieces. But most of the tools at the site were made out of that material. Beautiful points for probably not only spears but also smaller ones for bow and arrow. And what they discovered was that if you heat treat, if you put this bone into a fire for a certain length of time, or the stone into a fire for a certain length of time, you homogenize the stone and it's very easy to flake. This is a major engineering breakthrough at 150,000 years ago. It used to be thought that that only happened in the Upper Paleolithic of Europe. And they're beginning to find uh, necklaces made of various shells. Here's a piece of engraved ochre at, at 75,000. And it may very well be that the first Europeans, Homo sapiens, looked more like this than the classic view of the white European male. And I didn't realize till I went to a Maasai wedding in southern Kenya how important this ochre is body decoration because I was obviously an outsider in this group. I was, I'm not a Maasai. You can tell that for a lot of reasons. But as soon as this elderly woman came up to me with ochre in her hand and started painting my face, I felt an intimacy and closeness to her and I felt like I was being welcomed into that society. So use of ochre has played a very important role and continues in many populations around the world. You see someone driving here on the highway, putting lipstick on in the morning on the way to work. That's the kind of thing you're looking at. It makes them look prettier, sexier, more attractive, uh, etc. So this is something that uh, is going back much further in time than we thought. And finally, geneticists are mapping the genomes of populations around the world. 
And there, we're very derived up here uh, as Europeans. And they're finding that in South African populations, particularly the San, who are sometimes called the Bushmen, people who live in the Kalahari, that they have the highest frequency of progenitor genes, of old genes, genes that appear in populations all over the world, but usually not in great frequency or diversity. But in South African populations, you find them in the highest number. And this suggests that the progenitor populations of sapiens were coming out of Africa. So you have the archaeological evidence, you have the um, anatomical fossil evidence, and you now have the genetic evidence that pinpoints Africa, and particularly South Africa, as the progenitor region for Homo sapiens, people moving out of Africa into North America only maybe 18,000 years ago, uh, following the southern coasts of Asia into Australia, where we picked them up as much as 40,000 years ago, and into Europe at about 40,000 years ago. So that there is a consistency of independent data from different kinds of data sets, genetics, archaeology, anatomy, that suggest that Africa was indeed the homeland. And since populations all over the world, including the one in this room, all of us have African genes in us. The only way we could all have African genes in us is if our ancestors had African genes, which meant they must have come from Africa. So, in fact, as I say, and as you have, your professor has translated, we are all, in one way or another, Africans. And that the differences we see in red hair and light skin and so on are responses to microevolutionary changes in areas outside of Africa. So if these fossils, and particularly, of course, Lucy, have left any sort of legacy, the legacy is that Europe is not the finishing school, as it had been thought for 150 years. That Africa is really the, the crucible, the cradle, where natural selection has worked on populations over many millions of years to develop us and create us as very unique and separate creatures, but not so separate that we are completely separate from the nat natural world, because we are still part of that natural world. And the simple message that we are united by our past suggests that we are united as a species today, and probably in terms of where the species goes, we had a long discussion about this last night at a beautiful dinner, is going to be largely dependent on the choices that all of you make in your lives today so that you will leave descendants who will look back on their ancestors. Thank you very much.